Hey everyone, this is Patrick with the 307 RPG Podcast, and I just want to take a moment and say thank you to all of our amazing patrons. It's because of you that we're able to do the things that we do. If you like our show and you want to support us, you can find us on patreon.com slash the Forge Herald. Thanks everyone. I hope you enjoy the show. Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the 307 RPG Podcast. I'm Patrick. I'm Nolan. Our topic today is an interview with David Larkins, the writer for the book Berlin, The Wicked City, which is a supplement for Call of Cthulhu. But before we get to that, Nolan, what's going on in your world? Not a lot these days. We had to work this weekend, and so didn't get as much time for gaming as you always want. Uh, Falling down the rabbit hole of, hey, it's nice outside. Let's be outside and playing disc golf and a few games here and there when we can sneak them. Yeah, or when we can throw discs in the creek. Yeah, that's mostly what we do. We're going to become fishermen next so exactly but with nets so we can just hook discs we don't care about the fish we just want the disc back mm-hmm. i you know i haven't played a whole lot of video games either um or games in general i have been playing diablo 3 messing around with the demon hunter this season but nothing too heavy i'm you know trying to get, get those legendary gems uh leveled up and and of course realized after talking with you that i've completely reforged my shit incorrectly so i was working on that a little bit this morning Nice. Yeah, as you say, uh, Lord of the Rings has had all kinds of stability issues lately and server issues, and half the world's been down and up. And anytime I try and play, I get maybe like 20 minutes before I start rubber banding around the world and kind of just unplayable uh, kin chat or guild chat in their game is uh, broken right now. So you can't even talk to the people. I mean, it's, I don't know what their issue is right now, but they're having some pretty detrimental uh, playing issues. So. Might be time to switch gears and maybe go jump into Swole Tour for a month or something. Well, and it's you know kind of perfect timing that that we are ha- that they're having that situation, and I'm just kind of haphazardly haphazardly messing with Diablo because it is getting us out of the house and it is getting us you know like you said playing disc golf and just doing something outside instead of constantly sitting inside. But we like inside, so this is a big change for us. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. It is, but it's been fun. Yeah, other than that, I just not a lot going on for me, that's for sure. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the news. So 307 RPG News, as we near the end of July, I am excited, we are excited to announce our theme for August, Rage Through August. All through the month of August, Nolan and I will be talking about the game Werewolf the Apocalypse. We will be joined by some werewolf experts, uh, mostly the hosts of Werewolf the Podcast, uh, as well as breaking down some of the aspects of the game. This is going to be very similar to what we did in February with our Mage Brewery event. It should be a lot of fun, and it gives both of us a chance to learn about werewolf. I'm pretty excited. What do you think, Nolan? I'm looking forward to it just from a standpoint of it's still kind of the dark world, but being on maybe the other side of it. I don't know. I, I, werewolves kind of have at least at least they're trying to protect something, whereas a lot of the vampire clans just want to burn it all down. So it is probably a little closer into the vein of what I'm used to for role playing and storytelling games, um, at least not being diabolically evil and playing the long game and stuff. So I, I think it'll be fun to look into it and see maybe that it's not as uh, you know, ho-hum, these are the good guys as uh, I give them credit for and, and seeing the layers that go with that. Because I know we met some pretty dark ones through the Giovanni Chronicles, um, but I don't know if they were dark because they were bad or if they were dark because um, we were on the wrong side of the faction. So. Uh, I can't remember what it was. There was a, the evil cave or whatever that was had the evil feel in the shadows outside of London or something like that. And I was like, okay, this is a lot creepier than I gave werewolves credit for. So I don't know if they were good guys, bad guys, or just, yeah, looking forward to it. So in the Giovanni Chronicles, the, the coterie, if you will, uh, come across, I believe this is in the second book, come across a cairn of black spiral dancers now if you're a fan of werewolf you know right away that the black spiral dancers are the evil werewolves this is the white striders i believe um i think that's what their tribe was called who thought that they could end everything they could could destroy or end the battle of the worm by almost unanimously going into the the umbra and attacking the worm well they failed they failed miserably and were completely corrupted and it's almost corrupted because of their hubris uh and eventually became these twisted 
reincarnate uh, not reincarnations but these twisted examples of werewolves that are absolutely evil so you guys in that game you guys were ex- quasi exposed to a feeling of the black spiral dancers and and i think you're right i do think sometimes people think oh werewolves it's like playing captain planet and it is nothing like that at all because werewolves are defenders of gaia the earth mother but a werewolf's life is very short and very brutal and some of the fighting and stuff that goes on in that game, like if you're a fan of combat, Werewolf is definitely the game for you versus Vampire, which is like Nolan said, you know, playing the long game and you're diabolical, but you have your entire unlife to figure out how to get revenge for that one person who stole that photo of you. Right. And I like the idea that, I don't know, I, I like the idea of seeing the different, the, Oh, what are they? Packs in this one? I don't know, tribes? Tribes, yep. Okay. So I'm looking forward to I liked when we did the deep dives of the clans. It gave me a lot more respect for uh, stuff in Wizards. Uh, or not Wizards, Mage. It gave me more respect for the stuff in Vampire just from, you know, I think we all do that thing of, hey, here's a D&D character sheet where are you, and I'm naturally going to look at like Rangers and Monks first and maybe not give something else to credit. So this year is a nice way to just kind of I always come away with something, I guess, that I didn't know or have more respect for. Or I, 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 I will say that I'm probably one of the bigger fans of being a Nosferatu style than I ever would have just by looking at it on paper. I like their abilities. I like what they're about. I like that spy thing. So um, it, I'm looking forward to maybe coming away with something that I didn't know before and having a new respect for it. Exactly. And that's and that's what we're going to be covering. You and I will be covering the tribes. And then I'll be hopefully talking to you with Carrie from Werewolf the Podcast. I still need to email her. I've been so busy with other things that I just haven't done that yet. And then you and I will also be talking about breeds and auspices so we can go into you know what it is to be a werewolf a little bit by going obviously starting with tribes and then following up with breeds and auspices. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I've had a lot of fun playing the game of werewolf when I got to play it. We did a whole summer long campaign, uh, Chronicle, I guess, and just had an absolute blast. I played a Fiona that actually it's the first time I played a female character too. And that was many, many years ago and just loved it. It was a fantastic game. So I'm looking forward to it. Well, let's jump over to Dungeons and Dragons because finally we have news for D&D. Well, not necessarily news, but we do have some new stuff and that is a new UA. And as always, we turn that over to Nolan. Nolan, tell us about this one. The new UA is feats. Like feats for my sh- leg? Like I yep. need to wear shoes? Oh, okay. Yep. Then we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Extra appendages. Uh, no. So this time around is, like I said, feats and kind of an interesting take. Looks like maybe they went back and visited some of the older stuff because they did give us like a, a little more weapon based style. I know in the past it was like, hey, if you use a long sword, you get these. If you use a maul, you get this. Well, now they've got things like crusher. You're practical in the art of crushing your enemies. You gain the following benefits while doing it. So when you hit somebody with bludgeoning damage, you get to move it five feet. Or if you deal critical hit, uh, attack rolls against that creature are made with advantage until the, your next turn. So now all of a sudden you've staggered them and everybody else gets advantage on them. Uh, also increasing your strength or dexterity by one. So you can kind of focus on that, which I like. I, I enjoy it a lot because sometimes it's like great weapon master is a fantastic feat, but you're locked into that. So then what do you do? Do you not use the you know one-handed longsword that you find that's magical because you are now pigeonholed in that? And the answer is usually no, but now you've just wasted a feat. And so this kind of gives you a little bit more of I'm proficient in crushing or piercing or slashing. And now it kind of opens up that gambit a little bit more for the weapons you can use. Um, They did add a gunner feat as well. Um, So I think the idea behind some of this is getting you an opportunity to bring some of that stuff into different classes as well. You know, yeah, I want to be a ranger, but I don't want to be bow. I want to take guns without taking gunslinger. So they kind of open up some of that. And what we see with that as well is they did create uh, the fighting styles. So as long as you're proficient with a weapon, you can pick up a fighting style of your choice, which uh, rangers, uh, paladins, swords bards fighters all get like dueling defense uh two weapon fighting well now all of a sudden you have that opportunity and again feats are very precious but you know one of the best two weapon fighting classes in the game is a barbarian and a paladin uh paladin late game just because of their ability to add 1d8 radiant to all their attacks but they never get the fighting style 
uh, barbarians never get a fighting style at all. So now all of a sudden you can take this feat, add dueling, add two weapon fighting, uh, just to basically make it so now I not not everybody's doing a one level dip of fighter to pick up that for free. Um, they did do a couple things with some skills, which is nice. They added a chef, uh, giving some benefits to uh, the ability to cook um, and your ability to uh, help your party as well a little bit. So uh, with one hour of work, when you finish a long rest, you can cook a number of treats equal to your proficiency bonus. These special treats last eight hours after being made. A creature can use a bonus section to eat one of these treats to gain temporary hit points equal to your proficiency bonus. So again it's one of those you know we've got a couple of really decent skills in this game right now and this here gives some fun and flair to having those utensils a um, couple of big ones i guess too i mean it, it's really packed for just about every faction which is really nice for every class um i saw a lot of people were excited about poisoner and now uh, when you make a damage roll, you ignore resistance to poison damage because everything in the game has resistance to poison. Uh, you can code a weapon in poison as a bonus action instead of an action. You gain proficiency with the poisoner's kit if you don't already have it. With one hour of your working uh, using your poisoner's kit and expending 50 gold pieces worth of material, you can create a number of doses of potent poison equal to your proficiency bonus. Once applied, the poison retains potency for one minute or until you hit with the weapon. Uh, when a weapon is coated with this poison, it's at constitution saving through a uh, 14 or take 2d8 poison damage. So again, another opportunity to bring in, you know, they've got disguise kits, they've got poisoner's kits, and they rarely come up and poison's kind of been lackluster. And it's, it's a pretty big deal for a lot of people having that ability to work with poisons. So bringing that in is fantastic. What else? The other big one. Uh, meta magic, they they so that way you don't have to dip into sorcerer. You can take that as a feat and give you a chance to pick up your wizard to now all of a sudden have a quicken or extend, um, which is nice. Or even as a sorcerer already, take it again to pick up a couple extra sorcerer points. Uh, wouldn't be too bad. One of the ones that I thought was probably the best that I could see a lot of classes taking was Eldritch Adept. And this allows you to uh, take a feat. And in doing so, you can pick up an invocation from the Warlock class. The big ones that come to mind is like uh, a lore bard picking up agonizing blast with eldritch blast and now all of a sudden your lore bard which is one of the best reaction defensive classes in the game with a huge you know tons of skills all of a sudden became a really good blaster which is pretty huge and now all of a sudden you're checking out eldritch blast just as good as a warlock and now you probably have a pretty good character um, the other thing on that I liked was uh, one of the early Eldritch invocations is Disguise of Many Faces and lets you do, uh, or Mask of Many Faces and lets you cast Disguise Self at will, which I thought would be a fun one for, you know, if you were playing a rogue or something like that. And now all of a sudden you, you literally are a master of disguise because you've got the magic to boot and it's not costing you a resource and you could just literally pretend to be a changeling. I mean, I thought that was really cool. And yeah, some shield training, some stuff where you're attacking with each other and bonuses to help actions, some tracker stuff, some shadow stuff, uh, some extra expertise things. I mean, it really had a bunch of stuff and I'm hoping that we actually see this kind of stuff in a book. You know, we've talked a little bit about not having a, uh, it's been a while since we've had a, uh, what was it? Xanathar's Guide to Everything. So hopefully we're right. getting close to one of those where they bring in uh, a slew of feats, maybe some more magical items, some of these classes we've been talking about for so long. And hopefully this isn't stuff that is going into the next, you know, magic, the gathering source book or something like that. So I thought it interesting. You mentioned that cooking feat. It really reminded me of being able to prepare a feast or buff food in world of Warcraft. And, and we've had that conversation before. We're, we're, we've seen a lot of that with uh, pathfinder where like when you're taking a rest, like, okay, who's cooking the meal? Are you proficient with it? Awesome. Okay, go ahead and roll. Yeah, you made a great meal and everybody's well rested. Everybody gets plus one to their saving throws for the next 24 hours because it was that good of a meal. Who's on watch? You know, okay, you've got two people on watch. You had a 80% chance of something to happen. Now it's down to 20% because you guys are on guard. You know, and having those abilities that usually like, okay, you guys lay down for the evening. Is there anything you want to do? No. All right, you guys wake up in the morning. You know, it's, it's just one of those like, oh, it's like a Minecraft. You lay down in a bed and it fades to black and you pop up and it's morning. And this here gives a little bit of an opportunity to maybe take fight, 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 rest, fight, fight, fight out of the game and have some of those moments of 
wow, like I really appreciate your cooking skill, like, because it helps me throughout the day. You know, there, there's just those little things of like, are you going to, you know, all of a sudden it's like, well, so-and-so is cooking because they're amazing at it. And I always feel better after they cook. And I don't know how it must be magic because that's amazing. And it becomes a part of the game. And I think that's a good way to do it. I like, you've mentioned that to me before with how it's done that way. And it'll be neat to, if we see anybody take these feeds in our game, especially as we gear up preparing for Icewind Dale, it'll be neat to see if that happens. And, and of course, it comes down to the players remember to saying, Hey, I, you know, I have this feat. This is, you know, I'm going to prepare this meal and this is what I'm trying to achieve. So hopefully people remember. I liked it. Anything else with that UA? I don't have anything else with it. I, like I said, I liked it. I, I enjoy, no, I, I will say that I enjoy the idea that now I can pick up some of these class abilities without having to multi-class because I am the biggest fan of multi-classing. I feel like that's how you get the character you want to play. If you want a little more fighter in your rogue, uh, I want to play the guy from Princess Brides, that sort of thing. This allows me to use some of those feats and pull those in without deviating. Uh, and in the end, I think you end up with probably a stronger character because you, you know, you're still landing those big sneak attacks. Now I'm a rogue. You know, I've picked up two weapon fighting or dueling or defense. I've customized it a little bit more to where I want, and I'm not poaching stuff from every class in the game to try and get the the fighter that sings to me or the character that sings to me. Um, I think it'll be fun. I think some of it's a little broken, um, but again, I think our uh, <laughs> the biggest thing I've learned these days is if you're trying to win. The moment you stop trying to win a D and D is when you win D and D. So, make something, make it dominant in combat, go nuts, whatever. But also remember, it's the little things in between blowing stuff up. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm the first person that'll ever rush to try and hit 100 damage because it it's pretty sweet. But I'm usually also the first one that fails a saving throw and gets locked into a, a time warp prison force cage sort of thing as well. So, pick and choose your battles. Hit them for 100 damage once and sit out the rest of the fight, or just be that annoying little sneaky guy that controls and dominates. This year, I'll give you an opportunity to kind of mix and match and not dip too much. I I have always, like when we first started playing D&D again, I, I think I told you that I hated multi-classing. I just, I felt like it was just people trying to game the system. And and you kept saying, no, this is the way I'm trying to build the character that I want to build. And I, and I always thought, bullshit. <laughs> but, you know, the more I see it and the more I read about the UAs and the more you and I talk about it, the more you've definitely won me over. And you've made it to where I'm like, okay how can we play a multi-class this or this or like i've talked several times about playing the barbarian um i i do think there is absolutely a place for multi-classing and i think you're right yes i'm saying it you're right there it, it is a great way to flesh out the character and create the character that you're trying to build well and we've played long enough that if i show up with a sorkadin you know that I've read some stuff online and and you can tell pretty instantly that, okay, I see what he's going for. You know, the Sorlock Warlock, you know, type thing or the Sorcerer Warlock that's just the machine gun turret for Eldritch Blast is, is really good and really strong and very consistent. Um, I like playing those things because they can bail a team out, but I don't also go with the meta where... I, I, my favorite Sorlock that I've played so far has not been an Eldritch Knight or an Eldritch Blast chain gun machiner. It's been a healer that has something to do during their downtime and also has the ability to basically save those resources, not to Nova a boss and try and kill it in one round, but to bring the party back from the brink of death. And I, I like that thing of, I like pushing those boundaries. Again, the, the Barbarian. Uh, Barbarian's fantastic. They are excellent, excellent grapplers by themselves. Now, what do you get by adding the bar, the bar to it? Expertise in athletics. Now you are flipping Hulk Hogan. You are the master grappler with the charisma to back it up. I mean, you are the smack talking, you know, as it was the Rock says, the pie eating people's champion, whatever. Anyway, you know, now all of a sudden you get to do some of that fun stuff that you take it, you put a twist on it. Yeah, it's really good at doing this one thing. But as long as it's fun and doesn't, ruin the table i say go for it if i'm trying to solo every encounter with you know the cockroach build or whatever and i can never die and it's just me one-on-one -on -one with everything after everybody's gone i haven't helped the table i haven't done anything and so you being a master you know athletics guy that's got guys in chokeholds and and putting them in full nelsons while the rogues you know getting advantage and, and sneak attacking them i mean i don't think anybody's ever going to complain that you're too good at grappling and helping the team 
you know, you're too good at healing. You've saved our lives. Get out of my table, you know. But people say, wow, you did 120 damage that round, and then you did 150 damage the next round, and the boss is dead, and I only got to go once, or I cast my buff spell and didn't do anything. Yeah, I could see people being upset at that. So anyway. Sure. And I just had, you mentioned Hulk Hogan and The Rock and, and the Barbarian, and because there's so many different types of bards, why couldn't a professional wrestler wrestler be a barbarian in D D? Now I want to play this character, this Hulk Hogan type character who does do like, all right, I'm gonna put him in a headlock. Now suplex. Grab him, pin him, put him on the ground, and be like, oh look at look at look at I got his arm above his head right there. That's the weak stuff. Get it, brother. Oh my god, that'd be way too much fun. So I, I and I think that's the thing of, you know, take this is what I want to do. And that's how I build characters these days. And I think it's probably part of that is I find something that I want to do and I want to be the best at it. Do I want to be the best healer? Do I want to be the best archer? And and that's the thing is why a, a professional scout, a professional archer, you wouldn't just be like, well, I'm a ranger the rest of my life. No, you would you would seek out those people. You would go talk to the master archer that fought on the front lines and who's a fighter. And you would go talk to the rogue who knew the anatomy. You know what I mean? You like your pursuit of expertise would lead you down various roads in your life to get there. You know, you don't say, Hey, I've I'm a cook. Cool. What did you start at? Well, I started at Burger King and that's what I still do. No, you would branch out. You go to culinary school, you learn French cuisine, you learn Italian cuisine, you learn Spanish cuisine, and then you start your own restaurant with all the crazy shit you've learned along the way. And nobody says, oh, he's a multi-class chef. And you're like, no, it's some good fucking food. I appreciate that. And so that's that's my goal. I want to be the best blade master ever. How do I get there? Maybe a little fighter, maybe a little rogue. Uh, let's see where we can come up with some. Yeah, like I said, you've won me over. So, and now I, I want to play a wrestler. So, <laughs> we got to have a one shot. That's right. Where we're all, it's like Hulk Hogan's cartoon. We all play Hulk Hogan Heroes or whatever that was called. Oh, man. I think everybody has to have like two levels of Bard, maybe three, uh, and then two levels of another class. So then you could do Barbarian is like Hulk Hogan. I would do like maybe a Monk Bard, do like all kinds of jump and be a luchador. Uh, you could. <laughs> Roddy Roddy Piper, you'd be like this rogue barbarian. <laughs> so yeah. Sneak in shit. What are you good at? Low blows. Sneak attack. Oh my god, that'd be hilarious. I'd like to make a sleight of hand check. Okay, what are you going to do? Rake the eyes. Is the ref watching? <laughs> Jesus. That'd be so funny. <laughs> I Okay, so now we have to put something like that together. <laughs> All right, the, the wrestling one shot. To be yep. continued. <laughs> Exactly. We'll tell you guys how it goes. Okay. Let's take a walk down the Onyx Path. <laughs> Onyx Path is having kind of a busy time right now. Let's see. They at press they have the Scarred Lands Creature Collection, which was kickstarted uh later or, or last year. Um it is available on Drive Through RPG, so that is something I believe you can go ahead and pick up a print on demand. They also launched um, on Drive Through RPG this week Pirates of Pugmire, and Contagion Chronicle is prepping for printing. And there's a lot of other projects, of course, that they are working on that are at press or or advancing through those stages. I think the one that I'm most excited about, and I keep saying this every week, and I'll probably keep saying it until I have the book in my hand, is of course they came from beneath the sea. It is at press. And I know they are getting ready to get that settled and printed and shipped, which, of course, COVID you know, slowed that down tremendously. But that's a game that I'm absolutely looking forward to having in my hands and reading through. Now, I have the PDF, and I know that that came out uh, in PDF format for everybody who backed it a while ago. I just really like books. I, I'm i looking forward to it as well. I'm so happy they keep doing that sort of thing. And we've been talking about once things get back to normal getting back together in game night. And I feel like this is going to be one of those games that we could probably do, uh, you know, once a month pretty easily and people would still want to play more. So this is going to be a great one that, you know, we can sit down and say, okay, guys, we have two hours. We're going to play this game in two hours and really try to force it into that two hour window and make it like those classic sci-fi movies. So where you do have X amount of time to get it done. And of course it's going to take the director to really push them along, but I think it could be a lot of fun. But speaking of, they came from beneath the sea. Launching on Kickstarter this past Tuesday is the second book in the, the in the they came from line, and that is they came from beyond the grave. 
This game draws its influence from horror films and TV shows of the 60s and 70s and is full of all the wacky, zany fun that you've come to expect from hearing about They Came From Beneath the Sea. Matthew Dawkins was on the show last week to talk about a project for Call of Cthulhu, but was able to spare a little bit of time to tell us about They Came From Beyond the Grave. Uh, I do have a link in the show notes for the Kickstarter. It is funded. It funded the first day uh, i think people are very excited about it they've seen a lot there are a lot of um actual plays red moon role playing has an actual play out for it and i think you know people having seen the actual plays of they came from beneath the sea has got people excited for anything in the the they came from line so i did go ahead and back this one i think this is going to be an exciting one to play as well uh again i love the whole they came from series now i can say series um so i think it's going to be cool so if you haven't checked it out the link is in the show notes make sure you go and do that i didn't see anything else from onyx path that was too pressing uh, so let's jump over to bite size gaming uh, these are our friends uh, zach goins zach is they have a kickstarter going as well and i wanted to mention this because it is funded um their Kickstarter is a D&D 5e adventure titled Motherload. Now, here's the thing that I really like about this Kickstarter. It is low cost, so very low barrier to entry here when you buy this. Uh, it is being produced in a zine format. Now, Zach and David were on our show a couple, well, a few weeks ago now, and we talked about how they're going to be moving forward with some of their Kickstarters. And this is exactly what they were talking about. So the zine format is exactly that. It's a magazine so format. So you get this smaller book. It's not not the big, huge, bulky, you know, hardback book that you're used to getting from a Kickstarter. It is instead going to be this zine style book. Um, it is a it is an adventure that is designed for levels one through three. Um, there's a campaign setting. It's a brief outline in the setting. Now, these are the key features from the Kickstarter here. I'll just read these exactly here. It's a level one through three adventure designed around being ran in three four hour sessions with a guidance to extend the series by up to an additional three games. Campaign setting, a brief outline of the setting complete with a map for the new world of Ulstwin. I think I'm saying that correctly, Zach. If I'm not, you can yell at me. Uh, new player options, new player options, including four new backgrounds, a new race and new subclasses for Nolan, the Ranger and Barbarian. Additional players. I wonder if it's a wrestler. Additional player <laughs> options will be unlocked via stretch goals uh, and new monsters. At least five new monsters will be provided with the adventure. Uh, so I highly recommend you guys should go check this one out. I did back this one as well. Uh, I think it's going to be neat to take a look at this. I like the idea of these three, four hour sessions that I thought, Nolan, that this would be good for, you know, once our Monday night group, because I think we're going to continue that group. Uh, this could be something that we jump into with our Monday night group. I can dig it. I also want to take a look at their Ranger stuff as well. And I haven't, gosh, I haven't seen one that I love yet. And that's maybe I have too high of expectations, but I hope they did a good one. Like they're all good. I just haven't seen one. They're like, yep, that's the one I've been waiting for. Uh, you know, I, I wonder if you do have it set the bar set so high and without even knowing it that it's going to take something pretty freaking amazing to make you go wow. I think it's probably the uh, probably a fifth edition thing and not anybody else's type thing. Fair enough. So yeah, go check that out. Again, the link is in the show notes. It is funded. Uh, there's probably not a whole lot of time left on that one, but it, it, and I want to say Zach and them this this funded in under 48 hours. So they are doing a great job they have a lot more projects that they're working on highly recommend you go check it out over at chaosium it looks like we have a couple of new products uh new in i shouldn't say new as in new books but new in how they're being printed the printed and deluxe version of harlem unbound the second edition is now available harlem unbound is an award-winning source book by chris spivey at darker hughes studios for call of cthulhu uh it is available in that deluxe edition. I'll get into deluxe edition in just a second because there's a few of them here. Also available in deluxe edition is Call of Cthulhu Dark Ages. I think, sorry, it's called Cthulhu Dark Ages. Uh, this gives keepers the tools to play Call of Cthulhu in the Dark Ages time period. And then, of course, there's Rune Quest, The Smoking Ruin, and other stories also being released in deluxe edition. Now, I had the chance to speak with David Larkins, who, again, you'll be hearing that interview here in just a little bit, about the deluxe edition of the these books. These are kind of a faux leather cover. You know, they tend to be a little bit more expensive. I think 
the Berlin, the Wicked City book that David and I were talking about is right around $90. Now, I know some folks love buying those collector's editions, those deluxe editions. Uh, for me, they don't work only because I only will buy one copy of the book. So if I buy a deluxe edition, I'm going to use that book and I'll probably end up messing the book up in some way because I use it. Nolan, what are your thoughts on these deluxe collector edition books? It's really hard to, like you said, it's hard to use them, I think is the big thing. And usually they get passed around. Usually they're needed by other people. And that makes it really tough to try and like you said, maintain quality. Right. I, I'm I'm very particular about my books. And I, I think about like the Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition um, deluxe edition book that you and I have both looked at multiple times. And I hesitate so much to pull the trigger because, number one, I already have a copy of the book, so I don't like spending more money on a book that I already own. But number two, I'm going to use that book. It's going to get passed around the table. It's going to get heaven forbid, dropped. You can tell, I guys, I'm so particular about books. It's not funny. In fact, can I segue just a second here, Nolan? Sure. Okay, so many years ago, uh, when I first got into Vampire, I was sitting in um, my room, and my girlfriend, who is now my wife at the time, was sitting there with me. And I had this massive stack of my books. If a new Vampire book came out, I bought it. It didn't matter if I liked the subject matter or not. I wanted every copy of, or not every copy, but I wanted... I wanted all the books, so I was collecting them all. So I was sitting there, and the <laughs> my wife had this 32-ounce cup of iced tea. And somehow it got hit and dumped all over my books. I think, like, it probably splashed on seven or eight books. While I think tea staining is cool, it's not what I wanted to happen to my books. So I got I – was, I was a little – upset i didn't yell or anything like that i was just like oh my god my books i i love books and i tend to try to take care of them so these deluxe editions i think they're awesome i think i'd love to if somebody gave me one i'd, I'd be thrilled but it's just not something i can go out and buy because i know i'd ruin it yeah you, you have to like it i think i read all of the the Dritz books when I was younger uh, in paperback because I fold and break down the spine and I love them so much. I went out and bought the the hardbacks and tried to collect all of them and they've never been opened. So <laughs> it's a, it was a cool idea. It's not so much fun when you decide to move, but uh, I got them, I guess. So that's good. Until you, like you said, until you move and then you're like, why did I buy these hardback books? Exactly. But they are gorgeous, and, and I highly recommend you go over to chaosium.com and take a look. They are fantastic. In fact, David Larkins and I were talking about these books, and he says he doesn't own one, um, not even of his own book, which I tell you what, if it was my book, I'd probably go ahead and own one. Yeah, I can see it. I, and again, go through, play it, see it, you like it. Maybe you do decide you want to have it on your shelf you know, after you're done yeah. with it. So. Yeah, could be. Well, Nolan, that is all I have for this week. Am I missing anything? Do you have anything else? I don't have anything. Uh, it's been super hot and super quiet, and we're just trying to get through. So next week, we will start off our Rage Across August. We we have an interview with Josh Heath from Werewolf the Podcast, So, and that's a fairly lengthy one. So we'll have that for next week. And then after that, Nolan and I will be taking a look at the breeds, or sorry, the tribes of Werewolf. And then, of course, we're going to be looking at Werewolf 20th Anniversary Edition. So not to get confused with any of the other uh, versions of the game. Well, with that being the case, let's jump over to our topic of the night. So our topic of the night is an interview with David Larkins, as I mentioned earlier. David is the writer of the any award-nominated book, Berlin, The Wicked City. This is a supplement for the game Call of Cthulhu. David is a writer a developer, and a line editor for the game King Arthur Pendragon, which we get a chance to talk about. David is here to talk about his book, Berlin the Wicked City, Call of Cthulhu, which you can purchase at your friendly local game store or on drive through RPG. Uh, the link is in the show notes. You can also check out some of David's actual plays uh, with his group, The Esoteric Order of Role Players. Again, the link is in the show notes. And if you'd like to contact David, I do have his email in the show notes. With that, let's jump over to the interview. David, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing really well, thank you. Thanks for having so, me on. We are really looking forward to having you as we do jump into our month-long look at Call of Cthulhu, and we we want to talk at length about your book, Berlin, the Wicked City. But before we do that, tell us how it is that you got into Call of Cthulhu. 
Well, I originally uh, purchased the uh, fifth edition rulebook about 30 years ago now. Just kind of, I mean, I immediately fell in love with the game. But I mostly used it for horror one-shots, every Halloween, that kind of thing. And um, it really wasn't until about uh, 15 years ago or so that I started to run it in a more extended fashion. And I, I discovered that contrary to what some people on the internet will claim, which is that Call of Cthulhu really is only suited to a uh, one-shot style uh, gameplay where everybody goes mad and dies at the end. In fact, the game really shines the most when it is played in an extended campaign format. And, you know, I just started running longer form campaigns, 10, 15, 20 sessions. And what I discovered is that uh, the more players get attached to their uh, investigators, the more they get freaked out when the investigators are uh, put in danger. And so since then, I've run Horror on the Orange Express and Cthulhu by Gaslight campaigns, Arkham County, Miskatonic University campaigns. And uh, yeah, I've just really fell in love with I think it's interesting you say that that it really shines over those long campaigns, but there's quite a there's quite a risk to your character, even more so than say games like Dungeons and Dragons, because at least with D and can just well if I have to I can resurrect you. You in in Call of Cthulhu, and and I'm basing this on the one time that I've gotten to play this amazing game is that you can die horribly from horrible monsters or, or quite seriously go insane, and your character is no longer playable. That is true. How does that lend itself to a long campaign? One of my uh, maxims as a, as a keeper, which is the Call of Cthulhu term for a GM, is um, never kill when you can maim. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> and that, that can be physical or, or psychological. You, uh, what, what you do is you just kind of drag it out a little bit more. And so you, you uh, facilitate the characters in their descent into uh, madness and, and isolation. And uh, it really, it, it, it heightens the horror, uh, for sure. And um, it, it is a risky game from a mechanical standpoint. It, it encourages players to play smart. Uh, some people will even say, if you find yourself in the middle of a fight in Call of Cthulhu, you've already lost. Uh, now, certain variations of Call of Cthulhu, like Pulp Cthulhu, that's not necessarily the case, of course. But certainly, you don't want to just dive into uh, something without... Uh, mapping it out first and that's where the investigative aspect of the game comes in you know you want to make sure you you investigate as much as you can beforehand to you know, protect yourself as much as possible going into this hazardous situation look at the takes place primarily and correct me if i'm wrong in the early 1900s uh up to the 1930s when it actually transitions as you just mentioned to pulp cthulhu is that correct Yes, uh, you know, the, the original idea was that um, Cthulhu Mythos was developed by the writer H.P. Lovecraft, and so he was writing, he and his cohort, which was something that was uh, kind of new at the time, was that uh, he encouraged other writers in his extended literary circles to take what he was creating and do their own thing with it. So there was this whole cohort of Cthulhu Mythos, as we would say today, uh, authors, um, developing this cosmology essentially uh in the golden age of the pulps and this was like 1920s 1930s and so because these stories are so closely associated with that period the game defaults to being set in that era um that being said there are modern day call of cthulhu scenarios there are call of cthulhu scenarios set in the victorian era uh, recently there was a uh, cthulhu dark ages uh, source book that came out if you want to do like medieval Cthulhu. So it is it is adaptable. But yeah, the default setting in the core rule book is the 1920s, the jazz age. I always remember, because uh, I, I enjoy H.P. Lovecraft a lot, but I also, there's another writer who, and I don't know if it was, if he wrote um, in that cohort by the name of, his name is Manly Wade Wellman. And mm. some of his stuff is just as dark and eerie as H.P. Lovecraft stuff. So it, I always enjoyed reading his as well as Lovecraft stuff. Um, so complete tangent. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, Wellman's great. Uh, he wasn't. I don't think he was a correspondent with Lovecraft, but they were definitely uh, swimming in similar waters. We'll say. Yeah, absolutely. So you okay? So you you you've been playing the game for a long time. Is is this book Berlin, the Wicked City? Is this your first published piece for Call of Cthulhu? Yes, it is. It was uh, the first project I pitched to Chaosium back in 2015, uh, shortly after their, well, almost immediately after their new new management took over. 
and um and i i wrote it in late 2016 early 2017 so it just came out over the course of the last year. You said you pitched it to Chaosium. There was a, a, a leadership shift at Chaosium at that time, and didn't they make that announcement in Gen Con that year? Yes, it was at the it was at uh, their their seminar, their what's happening at Chaosium seminar, which turned out a lot was happening at Chaosium that year. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, the funny thing is, I hadn't actually originally planned on attending uh, that seminar. I think I had a game I'd signed up for that conflicted, and um, uh, so that was the first Gen Con I went to, and I had been working with uh, Greg Stafford, who is the founder of Chaosium and um, creator of uh, the King Arthur Pendragon role-playing game and RuneQuest. And so I'd been working with Greg on some Pendragon stuff at that point. And so one of the reasons I went out was to meet him. And so I met him, and then he said, hey, are you going to that Chaosium seminar tonight? I said, oh, I don't think so. And he said, well, I think you want to change your plans. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and so uh, so I did, and I'm really happy I did so because yeah, I, um, during the seminar they uh, they said, well yeah, you know, part of our our new deal here is we're going to start putting out a lot more material, and it's going to be very high quality, full color hardbacks. And if you're an author, or an artist, and you're looking to collaborate with us, we'd love to hear from you. And I had this idea for this Berlin setting for Call of Cthulhu that had originally been I was just going to run it for my group, and then kind of turned into like, oh, there's so much here, I could actually make a source book out of it. So I, I kind of like vaulted over the, the intervening rows of chairs at the end of the seminar and went up to Jeff Richard, who's the creative director, and said, hi, I'd like to write a book on Berlin for Call of Cthulhu, and not even knowing that Jeff actually lived in Berlin. And, uh, and, and Jeff shook my hand and said, absolutely, we'd love you to write it. Wow, that, that must have, you must have feel, felt elated when he said that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was great. It took about a year to get it together and get the contract signed and everything because they had a they were they were busy getting the company uh, set up under the new management. But I I, uh, I was very grateful for the opportunity that was extended. So you wrote this book, this Berlin, the Wicked City, and it takes place in 1920s Berlin. Yeah, technically set in the 15 year period from the end of the First World War to the, the rise of Hitler and the Nazi Party in Germany. Um, and it's it's this remarkable, uh, almost out of time uh, era where um, it's just all the all the uh, all the regular ways of doing things are just thrown out the window. Berlin was in a really poor state at this point. Yes, indeed. I mean, Germany in general was pretty bad off uh, after the war. Of course, they had lost the war, which was bad enough for their national prestige. But then, you know, they had these punishing. Uh, reparations and they had massive political conflicts between far left and far right wing uh, factions uh, who were both attempting to essentially take over the government. Even the government itself was being sabotaged from the inside by people who wanted the monarchy to come back and thought that if they sort of accelerated the death of the republic that the monarchy would come back. So uh, the country was being assailed from all sides basically and Berlin was sort of the locus of that. Looking at the book itself, David, and, and I see there on the back and even on the inside, there is a, a for mature readers warning on the back. It's just, just one line stating that includes drug sex uh, and, and mature themes. But inside, it really goes into some, you know, hey, be careful with this book kind of stuff. Would you say this is an 18 or older book? It's absolutely a, a parental guidance suggested kind of situation <laughs> for, for any gamer who's under 18. Maturity levels vary. One of, one of the things we, we tried to do was find that sweet spot where we didn't want to get too exploitive because there's so many dark things that went on in Berlin in the real world that you didn't even have to dress up with, with supernatural horror. We didn't want to tip too far over into the, the realm of exploitive. But at the same time, we didn't want to be too vague. We want to be real about what's going on. The, the subtitle, The Wicked City, is, is taken from real-life nickname that the city had at the time, which was The Wickedest City on Earth. And um, so, I mean, it's, yeah, as I say, parental guidance suggested. And even for folks 18 or over, we tried to write it in a way, I wrote it in a way, and then Mike Mason and Lynn Hardy, who are my editors and contributors on the book, helped me with the text uh, as well. And just in terms of finding uh, a way to write some of the more um, gruesome elements because we've got cannibalistic serial killers in there. We've got drug addicts. We've got uh, vice of all varieties, underworld crime syndicates, mad uh, occult uh, society. Uh, where possible, we left things flexible enough 
that you could just sort of uh, fade to black uh, in certain circumstances and not get too graphic or detailed if that's something that your group's not interested in. How much research did you have to put into the history or, or of Berlin during that time period? That was uh, definitely the most fun part of writing the book was the research um, because there's there's a fair amount of English language uh, resources and my, my German uh, speaking ability is not so great these days, but I can I can still read German well enough, and and so I could get into some of that original German language uh, material as well. But for example, I found a uh, Baedeker's tourist guide to Berlin from 1928 that you know gives you all the details on the hotels, how the mail works, how the oh, wow. you know, how the taxis work, how the public transit, and and stuff like that. So it gave me a lot of good just. The kind of stuff that gamers want to know about, right? It's like, how do I hail right. a taxi in Berlin? How, you know, where do I go if I want to find specific information on such and such, you know? Uh, and then, yeah, there's been quite a bit written about the senior side of Berlin. And so I got into that. But really, when I started to write the scenarios, that's when the research really actually took the lead for me and was like kind of showing me, hey, okay, so this is connected to this. And I, I really felt like an actual like, Call of Cthulhu investigator, like on the trail, turning over stones as I went, and every stone I turned over seemed to have more and more gruesome details to include. And eventually, I had to kind of decide, okay, well, I need to just stop at this point because otherwise, I'm going to write a 500-page book, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, actually, have some some uh, material that I hope to to get out to the public, some format in the future that was kind of on the cutting room floor. But 275-page book, and uh, it's still I couldn't fit everything in. I could open the door for little scenarios or even uh, extra micro books, if you will, for this for this setting. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I'm hoping to maybe start releasing some of those in the future. Horror role playing can get pretty intense for the players as well as for the the people who are running the games, be it the keeper, or GM, whatever you want to call it. But as a writer. You really have to dive into this and, and wrap your mind around it so you can present it to those who are reading your book. Did it ever get too heavy? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was very heavy. And uh, the way that I, I processed a lot of it was just to regurgitate it back into scenario content, which is maybe why, <laughs> you know, some of the scenarios uh, is where the mature content label came from, right? Um but, you know, I had some sleepless nights uh, in the course of, of working on the book and um, and had to take a break after writing the first draft, which I kind of did in one big, long, month-long streak. And then I, I took a bit of a break and then started running the playtests and sending the playtests out to other groups. Um, but, yeah, it was, um, it was kind of an all-consuming thing. I, I was lucky at the time because it was the only thing I was working on that, in that uh, winter of 2016 to 2017. So I was able to to focus on it exclusively, which I think just kind of helped me power through it, honestly. To be fair, you live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, so come on, winter's not that bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're at seven thousand feet, so we do get we do get snow. <laughs> yeah, but it's not Wyoming snow. So not Wyoming. That's one of the reasons I live here. It's not Wyoming. <laughs> but but you know, here's here's the thing. I I because I've traveled all over and and I know like I've been in Texas, like South Texas, and it's snowed at, like in San Antonio, and sure. I would rather be in Wyoming with snow because people at least know how to drive in the snow in Wyoming. Got it. Oh man, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, complete tangent there. Oh, so wow. let's talk about the book itself. So what do people get when they buy your book so uh like i say it's 275 pages uh full color and quite attractive if i do say so myself uh, <laughs> in fact you know speaking of attractive it is it's been nominated for two any awards congratulations thank you so much yeah best cover which is very well deserved by uh, loic muzi uh and then best setting that's that's incredible congratulations thank you all right, so dive into this book. Tell me what it is I'm going to get when I buy your book, because I already bought it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell your past self. Um, yeah, that, exactly. <laughs> so, so what you get is, is in the book, it, it's really more or less falls into two halves. And the first half uh, is, is exclusively setting information. It was important to me that the book not just be uh, rote scenarios that you just run and then you're done. I wanted to have enough material in here that people could 
say, Berlin is my home setting for my Call of Cthulhu campaigns, and everything I run is going to be in and around Berlin, and that includes like original scenarios that I'm developing. So I wanted to give people enough material in the book that they could do that. So the, the first half got a brief history of the city, and then there's the, the sort of urban geography, you know, the, the way the city uh, developed and the different neighborhoods. Uh, Berlin's one of those one of those cities that, that has very distinct parts. And, uh, and especially in the 1920s, depending on which part of the city you're in, you'd have a completely different uh, experience of it. Uh, obviously, lots of information on the Berlin underworld and um, everything that's going on with that, the organized crime rings, the prostitution, which was just a massive, massive part of the city reality. And the, Berlin was a destination for sex tourism. And because of the state of the economy and also just the sort of cultural dislocation that had occurred after the war, I think about a quarter of the, the city's uh, female population uh, used prostitution, at least in part, to support themselves. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty um, unbelievable. Um, and then uh, some fun bits too, like I have a random cabaret generator. You can roll a d20 a few times and uh, cook up a cabaret based on actual clubs that existed. You can mix and match from the different columns. Uh, I have a random city feature generator, so you can kind of roll up. You're in a random neighborhood. It says, oh, what's the architecture like here? What are some of the sites on the street? That kind of thing. And then um, also details for native German investigators, so like particularly German backgrounds, like if you want to be a, a, a political street fighter, something like, because basically every political party, including like the centrist party, had their own paramilitary wings. Okay. Oh, and wow. so, yeah, <laughs> you know, it was, it wasn't good. Cause they, it was like, well, we got to get ours, you know, we got to get our bodyguards. These guys got bodyguards. And so, I mean, it really was this like factional undeclared war that was going on pretty much throughout the entire period. Um, so if you want your character to be like, have some experience as a low level thug and street fighter, Hey, it's in there. But if you also, if you want to be a old school Prussian aristocrat who was once a member of a dueling club where you whipped razor sharp sabers at each other's faces and uh, gave each other dueling scars on purpose, then that's in there too. There's investigator organizations uh, ranging from a, a plucky, uh, almost bankrupt film crew to a, a group of pathfinders, which was sort of the um, uh, German equivalent of the scouting movement. So if you want to do like your kind of Scooby-Doo adventures in Berlin, which is perversely bizarre, uh, <laughs> you can do that. Uh, and then details on many of the historical personae that populated the city, uh, artists, writers, political figures, of course, philosophers, scientists like Albert Einstein lived in Berlin pretty much right up until uh, Hitler seized power. Uh, so, you know, you're, you know, I've, I've had play tests where the investigators go and consult with Einstein about this little problem with the uh, time-space continuum that they've run into, you know, so... Uh, that's all in the first half of the book. And then the second half gets into the mythos horror aspect. And so we've got uh, some cults that you can throw in. We've got some scenario seeds that you can develop. And then we've got this uh, three main scenarios, uh, each of which are, are pretty, pretty meaty. If you ran them together as a linked campaign, which you certainly could, uh, you're looking at several months of gameplay probably. And uh, one of the things we did with those scenarios is we used those as a jumping off point to describe Berlin in even greater detail. So like other notable uh, people from that era, like Aleister Crowley or Anita Berber, who was this kind of rock star actress who was born 50 years before there were any other rock stars kind of uh, situation. Um, she's just, she's an amazing historical figure that everybody needs to know about. So she's in there and details on the occult underground in Berlin, the various esoteric orders and so forth so um that's it in a nutshell <laughs> it's a big nutshell sir it is it is it's hard to condense <laughs> and there's a couple of ways that you can purchase this book not just the hard copy tell us about the different ways that you can actually buy the book yeah sure so um we always like to uh encourage folks to uh patronize your local game store if they have one and they can do so safely and a lot of game stores uh, participate in the program with Chaosium, where if you buy a hardback at the store, you'll get a coupon code that you can send into Chaosium. You'll get the PDF for free. Um, but if you prefer to buy online, you can go to chaosium.com. You can either buy the hardcover and get the free PDF right away, or if you just want to take a look and get the PDF first, and then you decide you want the hardcover, 
then you can uh, get the cost of the PDF deducted from the cost of the hardcover book when you order it. There's another very expensive version of this book too, David. Yes, Don't leave is. that out. <laughs> I shouldn't. You're right. The Leatherette edition. <laughs> uh, which, you know, I mean, I, I have a friend local to me who uh, who bought it. Oh, and so it's, uh, I like to say it's for the folks who, who liked a little bit of class in their uh, RPG collection. <laughs> Yeah, and and I'm that kind of person who I would buy a book like that, and I probably ruin it because I use my book. So <laughs> it's not a good one for me to buy, that's for sure. So with with the popularity of things like Critical Role, we're seeing a lot of people getting into role playing, very specifically Dungeons and Dragons. As you know, and as I know, there are there are a lot of amazing games. Some of them which have withstand the test of time, like Call of Cthulhu, like RuneQuest, and like Dungeons and Dragons. What would you say to that person who is standing in the game store, kind of sideways looking at Call of Cthulhu? What would you say to them to get them hooked? I, I, I would pitch to them that, you know, if they're looking for a game that focuses a little bit more on investigation, solving mysteries, and getting a bit of spine-tingling uh, horror out of it in the bargain, that's what they want to look into. It, it's it's definitely a big change of pace from D&D, and I think for some people that's exactly what they're looking for. And really, nowadays it's uh, easier than ever before to get in Call of Cthulhu because not only is there a free quick start PDF on the website, you can download, it comes with an introductory scenario, The Haunting, uh, check that out. But also there's a starter set which uh, gives you all the rules you need to play, including character creation, uh, the solo adventure Alone Against the Flames, uh, which you can use to teach yourself the system, and then Paper Chase, which is a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, one, one keeper, one player scenario. You can bring a friend in, teach them, and then Edge of Darkness, which is a full group uh, scenario that you can then run for your expanded group. And there's, uh, I think I mentioned pregens, a set of dice, handouts, everything you need, fully playable. And uh, really, I mean, if I was talking to this person and they were eyeballing Call of Cthulhu, I would recommend they check out the starter set for sure. Okay, so what about that person who's played Call of Cthulhu for years? Maybe they took a break and they're looking to come back to it because maybe they were like me and they somehow lost all their RPG books and are trying to get some of them back. But they played in, say, fourth edition Call of Cthulhu. Call of Cthulhu is currently on its seventh edition. What if they have some trepidation about making that transition? What would you say to that person? I mean, if the trepidation is based on not really knowing what changes occurred, because 7th edition did make the most significant changes to the game, but that's really not saying a lot, because the previous editions of Call of Cthulhu were more like kind of textbook editions, not, not so much like D&D editions, where there were major changes from each edition. Uh, the, the previous editions, Call of Cthulhu, you know, just kind of tweaked things here, tweaked things there. 7th edition did introduce some extra like actual rules like pushing a skill which is something you can do like if you fail your initial spot hidden or library use skill or whatever you know this is things that uh in the past people would say well that's going to shut down your your clue trail your investigation and uh, by pushing your role you get a second shot at it but you also open yourself up to disaster because it's literally making a second try like in the game and it's something that like the keeper can say, okay, well, you can push this, but if you fail, your candle's going to light the old archives on fire or whatever, you know, you're going to fall through the rotted floorboards if you keep jumping up on them, that kind of thing. And so it, it, it makes it interest. It makes failure interesting. Uh, it, it, it advances the story, whether you succeed or fail. There's an optional rule for spending luck so that you can actually blow through your luck uh, points uh, to succeed right away, but then live to rue it later on when the keeper calls for a luck roll and you have almost no luck left. Um, just a lot of little changes. The sanity system uh, is a little bit more, I want to say, uh, I, sh I should say a little less cartoonish maybe than it was in the past, a little more believable in terms of like mental trauma and a little bit more respectful of that as well. And But also generates really interesting outcome in terms of what happens to your character when they go insane. So yeah, I would just highly recommend anyone who wants to check it out. It's the same game you remember, but in my opinion, it's better because the things that were maybe a little creaky in the older editions have been shored up and strengthened. Can I just pick up your book and be able to play? Uh, yeah, I mean, you could, definitely. If you 
If you know uh, Call of Cthulhu, obviously this is a setting book, so you need either the starter set or the Keeper's Rule book to, to play Call of Cthulhu in general. The main scenarios in the book are, like I said, big scenarios. So I wouldn't actually recommend a first-time Keeper running those scenarios because they'll probably get kind of overwhelmed. But you can always take, in, you know, you can take the haunting from the quick start rules and just drop it into Berlin because it's a haunted house. You know, haunted house can be anywhere. So if you if you just drop in this haunted house and you've read through the first part of the book that tells you a little bit about the setting, so you can change a few few little details just to make it fit in a little better. Hey, run it in Berlin. But you do need to have the keepers at least the keepers handbook first. Yes, uh, yeah, or the or even the starter set would work. Yeah, this is okay. this is a setting book, so it doesn't have any of the core rules in it. Gotcha. Looking at the book. David, I have to ask, who are the esoteric order of role players? Ah, well, that is my that is my home group, and uh, we do uh, an actual play uh, podcast, and so there's a lot of um, Call of Cthulhu content on there, uh, including the complete playthrough of Horror on the Orient Express. I did play test the uh, Berlin scenarios with them, but. Those are not uh, out on the channel since those were playtest sessions. So, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of Call of Cthulhu content on there. If you want to listen to an actual play of Call of Cthulhu, uh, also if you're, you know, you mentioned Critical Role earlier, they did do a Call of Cthulhu one shot. So if you're more familiar with those folks and you want to see how they handle this game, that's a perfect opportunity. Penny Arcade did one, uh, and then Chaosium has its own Twitch and YouTube channel where they do actual plays as well, including. Uh, two of the scenarios from Berlin. Well, sure, that's like kind of where I wanted to go. Without without giving away any spoilers, um, what what can people expect from the scenarios? Well, like I said, the scenarios um, go into even more detail about the city, and they do so in a way that takes you on this journey through um, pretty much every every facet of the set you interact with uh with with criminals and and underworld types and you interact with uh russian czarist exiles and you interact with uh cabaret promoters and film producers and just all manner of of various characters that populated the city it also takes you on a tour of the different eras that berlin went through so like in the early 1920s this was the era of hyperinflation almost a post-apocalyptic uh, existence where uh, people, I mean, like I said, you know, massive political unrest, massive economic disruption, kind of relatable nowadays, uh, you know, but, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but even on an even greater scale. So you're sort of exploring the city through this, in this very uncertain and volatile time. And then the second scenario is, is uh, sort of the mid to late 20s when things have stabilized and Berlin's really earned its reputation as this, vice capital of the world and there's a lot bringing people in who are like morbidly curious tourists coming from all over the world it's actually a great period to bring in investigators from america britain other parts of the world i think uh the third highest demographic for tourism in berlin was japanese people you know so oh, wow. I mean, you could, yeah you could be coming in from pretty much anywhere but that scenario really focuses on like the cabaret culture probably the most famous part of Berlin in this period. And then the uh, the third scenario is set in the sort of gray and shadowy, uh, somewhat oppressive uh, twilight era right before the rise of the Nazis, uh, when basically everything is just going to you know, burst like a soap bubble. This illusion, this magical world that people have been living in in Berlin for 15 years just goes boop. In the uh, historical personage chapter, I put the years that people are in residence in Berlin. And I want to say about three quarters of them, at least, the, the final year is 1933. Everyone just packed up and got out, went somewhere else because they're like, this is, I can't, <laughs> I can't go on living here. Uh, you know, <laughs> I am now an enemy of the state. So, um, yeah, that's the third scenario is, is kind of reflecting that energy. David, we've talked quite a bit about Call of Cthulhu, but you're involved with some other games as well. What can you tell us about the role-playing game King Arthur Pendragon? Yeah, that is my my sort of main vocation right now. I'm the King Arthur Pendragon line editor for Chaosium. Uh, it's a game that's very near and dear to my heart. It's, it's another game I started to run regularly about 15 years ago, in addition to Call of Cthulhu. And it's it's uh, 
I wouldn't say it's the opposite of Call of Cthulhu, but it's definitely not a horror game. It's a, uh, (laughs) it's a, it's, you could call it a medieval fantasy game. You could call it a game of legendary fantasy because it is couched very explicitly in the legend cycle of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. So this is a game where everybody plays a knight, which is not as uh, mundane or, (laughs) or boring as it sounds. You're not all playing paladins. Uh, In fact, the point of the game is to find out uh, what kind of knight you are as you all collectively pursue glory and ambition in the context of this larger uh, myth cycle that's playing out. And um, the way you find out what kind of knight you are is that there is a whole system of traits and passions that drive your character. And so, for example, one of the occurring features in the Arthurian tales are people doing things that are not in their own best interest, right? And so it's like falling in love with the wrong person or going against your lord because your family is involved in a blood feud or something like that. And so uh, through the traits and passions system, it drives your uh, decision making in a way kind of similar to how Call of Cthulhu's sanity system will often force your character into situations that they might not have otherwise chosen to be in. Uh, And I just have to say, like from my own personal experience, the the traits and passion system in Pendragon create some of the most memorable uh, role-playing experiences I've ever had in my whole, you know, 30 years of gaming. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just the highest highs and the lowest, just it's, it's a drama engine and it it really drives um, some very memorable interactions, hatreds, love, alliances, betrayals, all that stuff. And even more so because the game can be played as a multi-generational sort of dynastic exercise where uh, with the Great Pendragon campaign, which is the supplement to the core rulebook, you've got the whole 80-year arc of King Arthur's uh, saga from the time of his father Uther to fights Mordred on the fields of Camlan. And really what you're doing is that's, that's the background, and it goes year by year through 80 game years. Wow. So if you're playing one year per session, which is sort of the, the assumed minimum, uh, that's 80 weeks. We did actually play through an entire uh, campaign of the Great Pendragon campaign on the Esoteric Order of Role Players feed. So if people want to check that out, it's on there. By the end of it, you've got your char- your first character's grandchildren or great grandchildren are are the knights fighting at the the old king's side, or maybe even against the old king. I mean, that's part of the fun of the game is that the whole point is players are the stars and they're creating their own version of the Arthurian saga, so they can ally with Arthur, they can fight against Arthur, they can join the round table, they can condemn the round table, you know. Merlin can be an ally, Merlin Merlin can be an enemy. It, you're playing to find out what happens. Since you're the line editor for Ken, uh, the Pendragon game, what does that entail? It mostly entails uh, directing what we're going to be putting out there, finding uh, writers and artists to work on it. Uh, Are doing you a bit looking of... for writers and artists? Always. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're actually working on a new edition of the game, Right now, you know, Greg Stafford uh, sadly passed away a couple years ago, but he was engaged in working on the the sixth edition. It's going to be of Pendragon at the time, and so I sort of took up that that torch, and uh, we're going to be putting out the new edition next year. So I'm very excited about that because it's going to be. I mean, we have a whole a whole lineup of releases that we're we're going to be putting out uh, starting next year even later this year, frankly. But uh, yeah, you know, it's a little bit of writing I get to do, and then also just yeah, directing product development, uh, contracting writers, contracting artists, um, art direction, you name it. I wear many a hat. Also write for another game, RuneQuest. Yes. Um, so RuneQuest is Greg Stafford's other creation. He always called Pendragon his magnum opus, but I think a lot of people would say that his uh, fantasy world of Glorantha was just as uh, magnificent and towering an achievement. And it really is just, uh, it's one of those It's one of those game worlds that's on par with, you know, think of any other fantasy world. I mean, Glorantha has had at least as much material written about it as as any other you care to name. And it's a, summing it up, you could just call it a mythic Bronze Age fantasy uh, world where Greg was a mythologist and he put all of his knowledge about myth cycles and legends of gods and, and spirit world and spirit realm and all that kind of stuff all went into Glorantha. Uh, and uh, created this this richly developed world that uh, RuneQuest was the original system for. RuneQuest, I think, published in uh, 1978, and um, 
It's currently in a new edition itself, which came out a couple of years ago, called RuneQuest Roleplaying in Glorantha. And it uses the same basic role-playing system that Call of Cthulhu does. Pendragon uses a slightly streamlined version of BRP, which uses the D20 instead of percentile dice. Um, but RuneQuest uses percentile dice, and it's actually every bit as deadly and unforgiving as Call of Cthulhu. So it's, it's a very interesting contrast with this like high magic, epic fantasy world, but like a world where you get in the wrong kind of fight and you can get your arm cut off. <laughs> so <It's fun. laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, it really, you know, pushes you to choose your fights wisely. It's, a, it's a, yeah. one of those games where you're not just going to be fighting goblins for XP. <laughs> so, um, and of course there is magic, so you can always get your arm reattached if you're able to save it. <laughs> back to Call of Cthulhu and, and going back to horror games in general, because it seems to me, and maybe it's just because I'm really coming into it, that there's a real resurgence in horror role-playing games. Uh, Vampire the Masquerade, of course, is on its fifth edition with a lot of stuff coming out from Modifius and Onyx Path. We've seen Cult, Divinity Lost, uh, just finished a very successful Kickstarter. Uh, mm -hmm. We've And of course, Berlin, the Wicked City, Harlem Unbound, all these things coming out for Call of Cthulhu. Um, are you excited for what this means for horror role-playing games? Oh yeah, very much so. I mean, I, I love Pendragon. Obviously, it's my that's my main gig, and I was I was honored when Greg, before he passed, was sort of handing handing the game off to me to to run it, and wouldn't have it any other way. Having said that, I love Call of Cthulhu. I love writing for Call of Cthulhu, and I love horror games as well. I've played a lot of Vampire the Masquerade myself, and so I, I I don't know. I don't have the numbers to back this up, but I would surmise that the horror genre is. Certainly in the top three, maybe even the second most popular genre after fantasy. And um, right. I, yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I just think that's great. I, I think it's wonderful that there's so much material out there. You mentioned that you, you also played Vampire the Masquerade. What are some other games that you enjoy playing? It's, it really is, you know, Pendragon, Call of Cthulhu, and Vampire. Vampire, largely because my wife loves it. And uh, so we, we play a lot of that just one-on-one, uh, -on -one, you know, call them duet games. A lot of those are on our podcast feed as well um and um those are definitely my top three these days um and i, I mostly will, will will dabble in other systems for example we're going to be uh playing uh the old uh artel saurian game castle falkenstein this summer uh which should nice. be fun yeah you know I, I i try to i try to mix it up and play a lot of different games especially if i can play in the game i'm going to be in a monster hearts uh campaign as a player coming up pretty soon just to to kind of keep up with what's with what's out there because the more games you play i think the better a game writer and game designer you are completely agree do you prefer to play or do you prefer to be the keeper it's funny like when i first got into gaming i definitely came into it from the perspective of like wow i can't wait to be i can't wait to have like a a cool fighter who like gets to 20th level and like builds a castle and has his own land and all that kind of stuff sure very quickly, I had to make adjustments because I was the only person in my like cohort who was into this. And they're like, hey, you guys want to play? And they're like, yeah, if you're going to run it for us. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'll teach myself the game and run it for you. <laughs> you know. So, uh, But in so doing, I discovered the, the subtle pleasures of uh, GMing and world building and all that fun stuff. So you know, I think at the end of the day, if I had to choose, I would choose GMing. But... Um, Lately, I've been playing a lot more just kind of as a break, and it's been nice. Good. What other, that obviously, that you can talk about, what other projects do you have coming out that are Call of Cthulhu related? So, yeah, I, I can't comment directly on the release schedule uh, since that's that's Mike Mason's job, but I think uh, there has been discussion of the new edition of the Dreamlands uh, source book for Call of Cthulhu, and that is going to have a scenario in it for me. It's actually meant to be the kind of introductory uh scenario like we're gonna kick off a dreamlands campaign you would run this scenario first uh which was a lot of fun to write and then i uh have a couple other book length projects for call of cthulhu i'm actually working on one right now uh but the one i um most recently submitted and i again can't can't give you specifics on when this will come sure. out or anything but um it's a source book for the down darker trails setting for call of cthulhu which is their sort of old west horror uh game and it's a uh, source book on the new mexico territory uh in the 1870s uh very near and dear to my heart and i just wanted to kind of feature the distinct culture of new mexico in this setting in a mythos environment 
and uh, also tried to bring in as many local New Mexico authors as I could on the project. So it was a collaborative effort. It was a lot of fun. But if people would like to contact you, what's the best way that they can do it? Especially if you're looking to uh, contribute on the Pendragon line, you can get to me through uh, the Chaosium website or through my Chaosium email, which we can put in the show notes. Uh, otherwise, yes. I have a, uh, a website that I never update, but, you know, <laughs> I really should probably update more often, which is sirlarkins.com. David, <laughs> it's funny that I have to say this because, oh, look, it's deja vu. <laughs> <laughs> I've greatly enjoyed having you on our show, and I would love to have you come back a little bit later to talk about Pendragon, to even talk about RuneQuest, if you're willing. But yeah. either way, it has been wonderful to have you. We are really excited to do this look at Call of Cthulhu for this month-long project that I'm working on, um, and I'm hoping that we can get other people involved in the game. So thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure.